Good evening and welcome back to CNN Money Switzerland. I'm Ana Maria Montero with your top stories on this Wednesday, the 1st of July. Masks are now a must in Switzerland. The Federal Council announced today that from Monday, passengers will be required to wear face masks when using public transport. The government also announced that Switzerland will impose a quarantine requirement for individuals entering the country from regions at high risk of coronavirus, including Sweden and Serbia. A full list will be published on the BAG website on Wednesday. Also announced today was an extension of payment compensation for companies putting staff on short time working hours to 18 months up from the original pledge of 12 months. And in light of the recent super spreader cases resulting from nightclubs in Zurich, controls are tightening there as well. The Swiss Federal Office of Public Health says that 137 new infections with the coronavirus were reported in Switzerland and Liechtenstein within one day, which represent more than a doubling of the 62 new infections reported on Tuesday. The 2020 Montreux Jazz Festival was canceled due to the coronavirus pandemic, but an extraordinary lineup still awaits fans at this summer's virtual festival. From July 3rd to the 18th, Montreux will be bringing archive performances to YouTube in an exclusive live stream series. Artists include John Lee Hooker, Charles Bradley, Nina Simone, Etta James, and Carlos Santana. Greta Rufino spoke to the event's managing director, Mathieu Jaton, to find out more. I know that you're organizing um, alternative online events. What can we expect from them? Yeah, we, we, we did during this crisis a lot of things. The, the, the first thing is that we, we, we did a collaboration at the very beginning of the crisis with Stingray and Coelho posting some of the unique concert of Montreux for free uh, on the archives. Just to let you know that the archives of Montreux since 54 years of music is the largest video archive of live music in the world recognized by UNESCO in 2013 as memory of the world. So uh, this is one of our assets. So we, we want to propose to, uh, to the audience and to the fans that are missing the festival to leave something very, very special during the festival and proposing them very exclusive concerts during the 16 days of the festival. So every day there will be one concert stream on YouTube exclusively uh, for our fans. Uh, and on those concerts there is a world premiere like uh, Johnny Hooker, Santana, uh, Deep Purple, very, uh, the 1976 Nina Simon concert, which is certainly one of my favorite concerts ever, but also a young musician like Tommy last year. What do people actually get from an online events? Is it more marketing for you? We know that we are very sad, uh, and all our fans also missing the festival. The artists also missing the festival, and all our partners, the city is missing the festival. It's really to keep the spirit. Uh, as you know, it's not because we're posting a concert on YouTube that is a money return so we will never cover the cost of the festival in doing digitalization like that so in a way it's to keep the brand alive uh, in a way it's to keep the spirit alive also for for the artists and for for the audience and have you organized other events to compensate the huge losses that you're having yeah, uh, I mean, that was a, a big thought with the city of Montreux. As you maybe know, the city of Montreux is very small. It's only 20,000 inhabitants, but it has a big patrimony of beautiful hotels like the Fairmont Montreux Palace. And those hotels are really suffering from this crisis. We are at culturally level suffering, but the hotels are really suffering. So we've been all the cultural events of Montreux, Montreux Jazz, uh, classical festival, comedy festival, we were all around the table with the hotel business and the restaurants and the shops and say, how can we just increase the impact of Montreux without the festival this summer? Uh, and we, we found a beautiful idea, which is creating an association called Montreux Alive, the Dolce Riviera. Uh, Dolce Riviera, why? Because Montreux, the most beautiful thing is Montreux is the sightseeing with the lake, with the pantries, with the hotels, with the beautiful terraces. So we're going to build a lot of terraces on the lake that people can just enjoy the lake. And of course, the different events will organize a stage uh, where in, on one side of the city, you can see the archives of the festival again. And the other side, there will be a live concert promoted also the young musician, the Swiss musician that were really uh, in a very difficult situation during this crisis. What can we expect for next year? Same artists? You have a plan already? 
Yeah, I mean, that, that, was a, that was a plan that every festival around the planet tried to do with all the agencies and the management of the artists. That's uh, 220 has been cancelled everywhere. So we're trying to uh, postpone the tour of the artist in 221. Now there is a lot of parameters is the artist can to make, the make the same tour next summer, etc. But most of our program of 220 has been moved to 221. And I'm crossing my finger that we stay so because that was one of my most beautiful program I ever had since I was at the festival. <laughs> The largest wealth transfer in history is currently underway with about 1.5 trillion US dollars in assets already changing hands every year. It's a huge opportunity for wealth managers, but many are unprepared, says Michael Spilacy, global industry lead for capital markets at Accenture. In his interview with Hannah Wise, Spilacy says wealth managers need a strategy for succession that includes a strong digital proposition. You're watching CNN Money Switzerland. I'm Hannah Wise and joining me today, we have Michael Spellacy, who is Global Industry Lead Capital Markets at Accenture. And uh, welcome to you, Michael. I mean, most people are, of course, focused on the changes and the challenges that COVID-19 have brought to the wealth management industry, the rise of M&A, fintech. But as part of your latest wealth report, you uncovered some interesting trends when it comes to succession. What are they specifically? Thanks, Hannah, for the time today. Uh, I think our fundamentally succession today is a, is a tale of two halves. It's a set of optimism for the future for most wealth, that, wealth, wealth managers, but it's also a, a set of real challenges for both, most wealth managers. The, the level of money in motion in succession today is at magnitudes that have never been seen before. You know, we expect up to $40 trillion of assets to be in motion over the next 20 plus years from wealth managers, and that's about a, a trillion to a trillion and a half per year in motion. Most wealth managers have no clear, coherent strategy to address that money in motion. Well, it's just because of the sheer amount of it. It's really not about the amount. It's more about the, the, the firm's business strategy and their engagement with customers. So for example, um, wealth managers, if you ask them how many times have you met with the spouse alone in the last nine months, the answer will be about 50% of them will say no. So half have not met with the spouse alone in the last nine months. I mean, and this about, is very interesting because actually, you know, what wealth managers really pride themselves on is this idea of the relationship with the client. And this is what they're concerned about, particularly with the rise of fintech. Absolutely. And, and very frankly, that over 50% of wealth managers have not met at all with the children of the wealth involved and neither have an understanding of the children's preponderance or curiosity about fintech, about social, about ESG investments, to, to name just but a few. And this is the key thing, because in the process of succession, very much the portfolio will change because the younger generations are interested in different things. Absolutely. And what we see very clearly is that um, ultimately, there's about that in the range of between 60 and 70 percent of wealth managers have really no strategy at all to deal with succession in its in its in its effect on the underlying children and their interest levels or values or focus from an investment perspective are you suggesting that wealth managers who don't um open up to the potential of fintech will be left behind Look, I think there's a tale of two halves, as we said before, is that the vast majority of wealth managers occupy a business which generates a lot of profit. That being said, if you go back over the last 20 years, or certainly in the last 10 years, the profit is just barely back to the levels it was pre-financial crisis. So we've had a wonderful rise back to what was the you know, levels of profitability historically, but the compression in the, in the margins of these businesses is enormous. You know, 70% of the industry has cost income ratios, the actual cost to serve a client. That's above 70% of their entire cost base. That is fundamentally an uneconomic proposition. You put that on top of how, how millennial investors, or for that matter, succession-based investors, want to interact, want to deal, want to engage with the firms at hand. You know, over half of all wealth managers have a very poor digital proposition. 
That's a really, really unique problem for wealth managers. They must change. They have to deal with that in whatever format makes sense for their business. The forces for change are clear. The size of the prize is clear, but the dynamics of the industry, in particular amongst the C-suite and, and world-class asset managers, is yet to really fundamentally embrace that nature of change. So the best way for traditional wealth managers uh, to scale up on tech in order to stay, stay in the race? Yes, absolutely. So for example, if you think of, you think of succession planning alone, you know, in the, in the ultra high net worth segment, you have approximately 300 families who will transfer about 2.7, $2.8 trillion of assets over the next 15 years. Those assets will be transferred to a generation which only engages on a technological dimension. So most asset managers are not even able to understand the level of interaction that their clients want to have. And it's not just about the interaction, it's about the engagement, the experience, the advice, the nature of the advice. The University Ad is the world's largest multi-sport event apart from the Olympics. Organizing the competition scheduled to take place in Lucerne in January 2021 is a challenge in any year. But for the first event of its kind since the start of the coronavirus pandemic, the stakes are even higher. As the search for 3,800 volunteers kicks off and final preparations continue, Urs Hunkler, Managing Director of the Organizing Committee, says he eyes the September cutoff date for a final decision on whether to go ahead or cancel. Urs Hunkler, Managing Director of Universiad 2021. How are things going? Well, we are proceeding. Uh, you know, we have been slowed down a little by Corona. Imagine. But uh, we have no, there is no way that we have to stop our work. If we want to be ready in January 21, we have to continue and to go on with our project. So I've calculated uh, 203 days to go, I believe, until it starts 21st until the 31st of January. Um, the volunteer program, you're looking for 3,800 volunteers and that's been uh, on the go for 24 hours. Is that really essential that it works? Do you think it will? Yeah, we have uh, started this, uh, opened this platform yesterday and we have a cooperation with uh, Swiss uh, volunteers. Yeah. It's uh, a platform who is uh, in place for many years and have, uh, has also for his, uh, himself has a stock of, I think, 15,000 volunteers. Okay. And uh, we have spread out our program and uh, of the Winter University Aid. And we already have uh, uh, people that have announced that they would like to work or to be a volunteer at the Winter University Aid in 2021. I remember looking at some footage and you were the president of the bid uh, that was accepted in 2016. And so I guess it's been quite a long journey the last four years. What have the last three or four months been like? Has it been off on no, yes, sleepless nights? Or are you, because you're Swiss, you're pretty relaxed and cool? Well, yeah, it has been a long journey already now. I've uh, entered the project in 2015. Yeah. And uh, yeah, the last three months uh, were... Uh, quite uh, busy and we had to think uh, how it uh, concerns uh, the, uh, the, the crisis uh, concerns uh, our project. But uh, we have uh, put on the, on the table uh, four scenarios and the scenario we, we are uh, uh, following now is a scenario that uh, we think that Universiate, the Winter Universiate can be staged in January 2021, 20, but with restrictions. Uh, it will not be the, the plan as, as we had before. We have to, to see and to manage some restrictions. How has the budget evolved in the, in, in the time? Uh, we have a budget of, uh, of uh, 39 millions. Uh, we had, uh, when we were doing our bidding, it was a little lower. But uh, when we came up with a bottom-up budget, we ended at uh, 39 millions. The financing of this budget, a uh, large part of the, the budget is covered by public, uh, by the Swiss government, by the six cantons, but also by sport uh, organizations like Swiss Olympic or Swiss University Sports. 
And we also have uh, private partners, uh, companies who uh, are going with us uh, the path to, to 2021. And the private partners, are they keeping going? Then no one's pulled out? Uh, they, are, they are asking, they are interested. Uh, how is it going? Uh, are you going to stage it? And we, we are in close contact with these partners and uh, explain uh, our, our uh, way, our, our path, uh, how we, we proceed and, and uh, what, what we are doing and what we are planning. Now, uh, this morning, uh, the, the Youth Olympic Games, which was about five months ago in Lausanne, they just released their, their figures of the actual event, which was a, a budget of 48 million. And they say they make uh, an operating profit, I think that's the words, of about 400,000 Swiss francs. What are your uh, predictions? Are you going to break even, make money? H how's that going to pan out? Well, we have uh, put up an association uh, to stage this uh, Winter University Aid and uh, you know, there is no aim to make any profit out of it, but uh, we are also uh, under control that we do not uh, have a deficit at the end. So we, our aim is to be even uh, and, and we have to balance, uh, you know, income and, and uh, costs. It's been well documented. Tokyo 2020 has gone to 21. Do you have a plan B in case there's some uh, there's some challenges? Because you have, what, two and a half thousand athletes coming over 50 countries. Do you have a plan B? Could you put it back to the next uh, next year? Or, or how, how does that uh, come into your, in your thinking? Uh, this is uh, one of our scenarios. Uh, we were thinking about it, the postponement. Uh, right now, we do not believe that this is a uh, very has any uh, realization uh, prospect because uh, you know in 2022 there will be Olympic Games yes and uh, they start already uh, February 4th and uh, right now we think that uh, it will be difficult to find a new date if we have to postpone it, we also have to speak to all our partners, uh, to the hotels, to the, to, to the venues, if they are uh, able to, to postpone. Do you have a cutoff date when you actually can, when's the last time you can make a decision? We are now planning uh, our, our, our uh, concepts with, with these restrictions. And, and we will do this uh, the next two months. And yeah. we think that in September, end of September, beginning of October, we have to decide if we can go or if we have to stop. Because after this uh, time, you know, the costs will increase yeah. and then it will really be difficult uh, to stop the project. As the number of cases soar in, in the United States, the EU braces for the loss of US tourism dollars. CNN's Fred Pleitgen has a story in Brussels. Emptiness and fear on the streets of Rome, one of Europe's most beautiful cities. While the EU is opening up for travel after most states have contained the coronavirus pandemic, American tourists won't be back anytime soon. Restaurant owner Mauro Pizzuti says that's another significant dent in his already meager earnings. We are very concerned, he says. We live off of this. I wouldn't know if it's right or wrong, but I would have preferred for the borders to be opened because we're on the ropes. It's not just Italy. France is one of the most popular destinations for American tourists in Europe. According to the country's tourism authority, around 4.5 million Americans came here in 2018, spending almost $4 billion in France, much of it in Paris, the head of the city's tourism authority tells CNN. The American U.S. is very important for Paris in terms of tourism. Uh, people, American people spend about $2 billion, uh, actually, so that's a huge uh, loss for Paris for the moment. But the EU has decided to continue to ban U.S. citizens from coming to the European Union, excluding the United States from a list of nations from which the EU will allow travelers back in. As the Trump administration struggles with skyrocketing cases of coronavirus in parts of the United States, while the president rejects public health measures like wearing a mask. While the EU is keen to jumpstart its ailing tourism sector, officials both here in Brussels and in the member states say the continent needs to be careful when opening up 
the last thing Europe needs is another spike in coronavirus infections and possibly another lockdown. European Union officials have long been saying they will place public health above economic motivations when bringing their economies back up to speed. The most important uh, thing is to prote the protection of public health. In the over this is the most important priority for the EU and its member states. And that means as Rome's streets start filling with travelers once again, restaurant managers like Mauro Pizzuti will have to wait till the U.S. gets the pandemic under control for Americans to return. And don't forget, you can always find all of our content on our website, cnnmoney.ch is the place to go. And of course, you can always stay in touch with us via our social media platforms. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Do take care and we'll see you right back here tomorrow.